Uh, thank you to the organizers for extending an invitation to me to come and give a keynote lecture about hops. Um, my lab does a lot of work in hops, hop flavor, the connection of hops to beer quality. Um, it combines chemical instrumental measurements with sensory measurements, and I'm going to talk about none of that today. I'm going to talk about the future of hoppy beers. Uh, Gino had asked me, you know, give me a sense on what you think is going on with the future of hoppy beers. And this is going to be very much a U.S.-centric um, perspective because the things that are happening in the U.S. I think are having an impact on what's happening in Europe. And, and uh, Ina's talk this morning was sort of about that, I don't know, tension almost uh, there between the U.S. and, and Europe. I, I don't know if, it's, if, it, if it exists as tension, but there was clearly an interplay between what's going on in the U.S. and what's happening elsewhere in the world. So what I want to talk about um, uh, is just this. You know, how does the things that are happening in the U.S. Um, serve as a potential bellwether for what's going on in, um, elsewhere in the world and kind of a, a, what may be coming down the pike? Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the Cascade Hop, how it was developed. It's an interesting history lesson there, and uh, it's a good metaphor for what's happening in the craft industry and with other hops that are coming behind it. Uh, certainly the craft beer growth in the U.S. is having a huge impact on the demand for raw materials. U.S. craft brewers are using half of the U.S. hop crop, um, and that impact is being felt uh, in the breeding area. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about breeding. In short, it takes a long time. And so it makes it very difficult to predict out 10 years what's going to be happening um, to um, beer demands, beer styles, uh, when you're a hop breeder in 2015. And then finally talk a little bit about hop farming and the impact that the demand is having in hop farming, which is a positive thing. We're seeing unprecedented kinds of investments in hop picking and hop drying, and so this is only going to benefit the, the industry and it's going to benefit hoppy beers. So this picture was taken four weeks ago at the Hop Research Council meeting in Yakima, Washington. The Hop Research Council is a group of um, growers, processors, breeders, um, and academics. Um, the, the growers, processors, uh, merchants are funding research. The academics are doing the research. And, um, and this is Doug Walsh here in white. Um, he's the, he's a, a Epidemiology, I mean, I'm an IPM guy looking at um, you know, beneficials and bugs and things like that. And this is after lunch. And um, what's interesting is the beers that are on the table here. Not that there are beers on the table, it's a brewing meeting, um, but it's the kind of beers. So for years, the Hop Research Council and the mission of the public breeding program in the US has been to chase alpha. The, um, brewers are focused on alpha utilization, hop utilization as defined by alpha. The growers are, are focused on um, yield and tons of alpha produced. The hop merchants are looking at global alpha demand and versus global alpha production. Um, it's really been about alpha, but things are changing now. The craft brewing industry and the huge demand for aroma hops is totally changing that, and that's what the story of, of my talk is today. And so these beers here, these beers are not defined by alpha acid acid content. They're defined by aroma. This beer right here, Pliny the Elder, um, is kind of a cult beer. If you're, uh, to give you some context, the, the beer geeks that uh, write about beer and, and, and vote about beer, um, they, you know, give this a 100. It's, you know, one of the best beers in the world. It's going to be like the West Flatering 12 that we'll have this evening. One of those other best beers of the world. Okay, what makes this the best beer of the world? Um, the guys that, the beer geeks that like this, like beers that are alcoholic, right? So this is a, that's hard to see here, but it's an 8% ABV alcohol. It's a 100 BU beer, so very, very bitter. Interestingly enough, though, it's very fruity, very balanced. So even though it's high in bitterness, it's not overwhelming in terms of its flavor. I mean, in terms of the bitterness, it is very intense in terms of flavor. And probably the biggest thing that makes it the, the best beer in the world is its scarcity. Right? That's what uh, the beer geeks like, is beer that they can have but no one else can have. Um, and so that's sort of what, what makes it such. But the point is that here we are um, talking about hops, and really the focus is moving more and more towards aroma. And the beers that you see on the table are all IPAs. It's not um, the, the, the classic American lager beers. 
Now, uh, to be clear, the main demand for the type of, of beers that are being produced around the world are these kind of beers. Okay? Pale lager beers, often made with adjunct, lower in alcohol, not lower in alcohol, but certainly lower than Pliny in the range of 4 to 5 percent, um, 18, I mean, 8 to 12, 18 to 15 BUs. So this is, um, the, the, the story I'm telling you is going to have an impact on these kind of beers in terms of the availability of the quality of hops, but it, I'm not um, pointing to the fact that we're going to see the transformation of, of Budweiser into uh, a dry hopped 8 percent, 100 BU beer. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Cascade Hops. So Cascade Hops is, is a hop that uh, defines craft beer uh, throughout the world. Um, the, uh, the, the path that we're on right now, as far as craft brewing is going, um, sort of originated with the Cascade Hop, a little bit by accident. And, um, and when brewers are using this type of hop, it's really to signal to the consumer that this is not your father's lager beer. This is something different. And uh, I think it's helpful to, to hear a little bit of a history story about, um, about how this hop was created. So back in the 1930s, um, Oregon was the largest hop growing place in the world. Who would have known, huh? Um, and in 1933, there, well, one thing that's interesting is prohibition ends. So here we are, the largest hop growing region in the world, but we're not even technically supposed to be making beer in the US in the 1930s. Um, but in 1933, we had this huge uh, outbreak of um, powdery mil or downy mildew, and um, the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, responds by developing or putting a research site in Corvallis, Oregon to develop public breeding lines that are resistant to downy mildew. So that was the, the main focus, is just building germplasm that was resistant to disease. In 1950, Stan Brooks is the hot breeder. Um, he's the father of Cascade. That's this guy right here. And uh, what he's doing in the 50s is trying to find new varieties that are going to be very similar to Germanic varieties. When you think about the brewing industry in the 50s in the United States, uh, it was dominated by regional breweries um, that were producing lager beer. They all had very Germanic um, history in terms of the roots of who started those breweries and the type of beer that is being, was being produced. So the hop breeding folks were focused on replacements for German varieties that could be grown in the, the Pacific Northwest. So that was the, that was the focus. And in 1955, um, as, it, as breeders do every year, they're collecting seeds from a cross. In this case, it was an open pollinated cross of Fuggle. And we now know that the, the pollen that was used to um, uh, pollinate that one was a pollen from a male um, Russian variety, Serbrianca. Okay, so that's how um, Cascade really got its, well, begins. This uh, is in 1955, and in 1967, okay, 12 years later, we finally see the first acre of hops that are coming out of um, the, cas the, the hop yard. This is in Corvallis, Oregon, back in the 50s. And 56013, which was yet, would yet to be named, is, is harvested at, at a one acre um, level. So in 1972, um, uh, the, the, the new hot breeder uh, is Al Honnold, um, and he officially releases this variety um, because finally someone is interested in this. Uh, the Adolf Coors Brewing Company is interested in looking at this, and they're looking at it as a replacement for the Hallertau Middle Froom, which seems kind of curious because Cascade smells and tastes nothing like Hallertown Middle Fruit, but these guys were going to give it a chance. And other than if these guys didn't go after it, it was going to hit um, the, uh, the dumpster. So it was not destined for success unless somebody picked it up. But remember, keep in mind that the brewers at the time were not focused on flavor hops, as we call them now. They were focused on Germanic varieties. So that was the first um, uh, trial of this, and you can see the timeline is long. Um, since then, though, um, Cascade has grown uh, in popularity. Now in the U.S., it's uh, second only to CTZ in terms of hop um, acres. So it's really it's the second largest hop that's being produced in the U.S. It's a very different type of hop um, than, um, than Hollertown Middle Fruit, than the Germanic varieties that were being produced at the time. And it's sort of setting the stage for a whole wave of very fruity, citrusy, tropical flavored hops that are coming in behind 
behind it. And that's where the future for um, new breeding is going. In 1980, Ken Grossman starts the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, and the hop he chooses is the Cascade Hop. This is a beer that's defined by Cascade Hop. It sort of sets the trend for craft brewing in the US, and as it grows, other people that are wanting to copy craft styles are using Cascade Hop um, in, in beers like this. Now, I'm going to turn my attention a little bit to the craft brewing movement in the U.S., and this kind of shows where things are going, um, at least in the U.S., and, and where things probably are going around the world. We, see, we saw some of these numbers this morning when um, Joe Swinnon was, was talking about his, the beer economics. So just to give you a snapshot, in the U.S., it's a tale of two cities. We got the two giants, AB InBev and Miller Coors, that produce collectively 92% of the domestic beer production. And then we've got an ever-increasing number of craft breweries, now close to 4,000, that are producing the remaining 8%. And so when you peel off these top two guys here, and you look at what's underneath there, um, here are some of the brands. So um, Sam Adams Boston Lager, this is produced by America's largest domestic um, brewer. Um, they produce a little over two and a half million um, barrels, and so we had this discussion this morning a little bit. What is craft? Does size matter? Independence matter? And then you got Sierra Nevada Brewing Company right after that, New Belgium, et cetera. That Pliny the Elder that we saw, that beer comes from a brewery that's one-tenth the size of, of this brewery. It's a fairly small brewery. But it's these guys that are having the big impact on raw materials and beer styles in the, in the US. These are data from the Brewers Association, and um, they, they tell an interesting story. You know, last year, this is from uh, 2014 data, overall, the US beer market grew by one half of 1%. Domestic beer sales, the beers like um, Anheuser-Busch products, Miller Coors products, those flagship brands were actually down. But what was up was craft beer. Craft beer was up again by nearly 18%. Um, import beer was also up 7%. And as we uh, heard this morning in uh, Enos talk, um, craft beer exports to Europe and elsewhere uh, were up um, by 36%. So a lot of up, up, up here. Um, but that being said, um, the craft beer market still represents only 11% of the, um, the, the total US beer market. But um, that growth has been steady and strong, particularly in these last five or six years. This is US beer production in terms of volume, expressed as beer barrels, not hectoliters. Um, but you're seeing strong upward growth in terms of the volume that's being produced. And if you look at the beer um, brewery numbers, um, this just goes back to the 70s when we were kind of at a low spot in terms of the number of breweries in the US. And we saw the, the sort of takeoff of the craft brewing in industry in the 90s, this plateau that occurred uh, until, well, until about you know, 2000 or so. And then we've been on this really wild ride. And I think the industry is holding its breath to know, are we going to be returning, or not returning, but moving into something like this? Because the growth is just going um, phenomenal. But that's a number of breweries. Um, to be clear, most, if not all, of these breweries are really quite small. When you look at these numbers here, um, you know, not quite half of them are brew pubs, so they're very, very small operations. We've got lots of small microbreweries. And then the regional breweries, these are the ones that we showed in that first bar graph. So it's dominated by many, many very small um, operators. And so um, the total production amount, as I mentioned earlier, um, in terms of volume is about 11%. But the impact is that that 11% has is that it's consuming uh, over half of the hops that are being produced in the US. So uh, the big global brewers are, are feeling the elbows of the, the craft brewer. And, and why is that? Well, when you look at the hop usage level, um, hop usage level in the craft industry has been growing over the past few years. Um, to put this in a context, if you look at the Barth Haas report and their estimate on terms of average alpha usage per hectoliter, and just assume a 10% alpha hop, on average, brewers around the world use about 0.05 kilograms of hops per hectoliter. And so here we are well over an order of magnitude increase in that. And I know of many brewers in the US that will late hop, dry hop once, dry hop a second time, after good measure, will dry hop a third time. 
they're using about two kilograms of hops per hectoliter. That's roughly a hectare of hops in a 1,200 hectoliter fermenter or, or bright beer tank. And that's clearly unsustainable. So that when you look at the future of how uh, hoppy beers and how hops are being used, what we're gonna see in the next, this next wave is sort of a reality check on the availability of hops and a, a reality check on how brewers are using hops. The beer losses in that case are huge. The hop utilization is extremely low. And, um, and as prices go up, um, brewers are gonna be forced, at least the, the craft brewers in the US are gonna be forced to um, uh, to look at how they're, they're making beer because it's just it's, one it's not going to be profitable and two it's um, it creates um, demand pressures on hops so that high usage combined with the increasing um, growth has had a big impact on the hop um, profile that is that is in the field when you look back just eight years ago less than 20 percent of the hops being grown in the US were aroma hops. And now we're on track here for close to 70%. So just in eight years, the, the field, the nature of what's been in the, in the ground has completely flipped. And so the US market is now producing lots of different types of, of um, aroma hops. And when we look at what are some of the, the top guys that are growing, so these are data from 2012-2013. Um, these are the, the folks that are growing the most. Uh, Willamette is not is actually declining. There are two big takeaways from this um, this, met, this graph here. The first is that these three varieties here that are growing the most out of all these hop varieties are not public varieties, they're private varieties. The public breeding program is not seeing a huge infusion of cash that corresponds with the, the increase in, the, in success in the hop business while the private breeding programs has. And so they put more and more efforts into breeding varieties, they got a bigger program, and they do a very good job marketing them. And these varieties here are catching the attention of consumers and brewers alike. They're very citrusy, tropical, um, um, exotic, distinctive, recognizable flavors. Um, and when you look around the world, um, the new varieties that are coming out are like these varieties. You look in Australia, things like Galaxy, Ella, Vic Secret, these are very distinctive varieties. In the German market, um, things like Mandarin and Barbaria, uh, and, and coming releases are in the same nature, very um, fruity, fruit forward uh, type of varieties. The, um, the perspective that the consumer has is changing. The consumer is being, I think, more sophisticated in their understanding of hops. At least we think they are. I mean, there certainly are some consumers that when you give them a, a very malty beer will tell you that it's obviously a very hoppy beer. They're confused about, about flavor. But there are um, some brewers that are counting on the fact that some of their consumers are so savvy that they understand varietal names of, of, um, of hops. So these are beer labels from three of the four corners of the United States. This is Atlanta, this is San Diego, this is up in Alaska, all featuring mosaic. Okay, so it's branded mosaic hops. It's, it's not just a mosaic beer, it's made with mosaic hops. And the idea of single um, hop beers are intriguing to brewers and consumers. They're not necessarily the, the most complex, They're, they can be a little bit more unidimensional, but it's a it's differentiation. There are some brewers that are making beers with blends of hops, but using sort of this tag, you know, now featured with more extra dry hop flavor, specifically mosaic flavor. So we see this with mosaic, and we also see with other types of, of aromatic hop varieties, uh, these, these flavor hops. So Cluster, Amarillo, Chinook, Cluster, Cascade. So brewers are now beginning to market beers with varietal, labels on them, which I find interesting. If 10 years ago I was to tell you guys or anybody in the brewing industry, uh, someday in the near future you're gonna be selling beer like you sell wine, like vintage varietal, uh, and we're seeing that now uh, in the craft beer sector. The US beer consumer, it's a spectrum, clearly it's a spectrum. But people that are focused about um, Pliny the Elder, they're these guys, right? These are the beer geeks. Um, Intensely flavored beers, scarce beers, um, that's what appeals to them. 
The average craft beer drinker, okay, I think what's happening is we're seeing that the, the interests that these guys have are kind of starting to spill uh, or, or move into um, or along the spectrum towards the average craft beer drinker. And that's why you see people actually producing varietally labeled um, um, hoppy beers. Uh, I have no idea if one day the, the Bubba beer drinker will be wanting a varietally labeled um, craft pills, but you never know. So, the, um, let's talk a little bit about breeding. Uh, in short, it takes a really long time. And so the challenge here is that the dynamics that we're seeing play out now, breeders and farmers are having to make a bet on what's gonna happen 10 years from now because the process takes at about a minimum 10, 10 years. These slides, this slide comes from Jason Peralt. He's a hop breeder for select botanicals uh, and is a fourth or fifth generation hop farmer. And so what you see you know, from year one all the way through to year 11 is one, it takes a lot of time um, and it, it's huge numbers. So you, it, he might start out with anywhere from um, 50 to 100,000 individual cultivars, and then it's just a matter of weeding them out. So the first year is putting plants in the greenhouse and letting disease take over, and it's just attrition. So what comes out of this is maybe a 10% selection. So if we start with 4,000, um, 40,000, we've got 4,000 at the end of year two. Those go into the ground. This is happening every year, so it takes space physical space for this to, to occur. Um, in years three, four, and five, you determine what the sex of the plant is. You get a sense to some degree on how vigorous it is. Again, more uh, estimates on disease resistance. Again, here we're seeing a, a huge reduction. We take, pull out about 1% of these, so now we're down to 40. These move into an advanced selection stage where they're actually grown in multi-hill plots, oftentimes interspersed in a commercial hop yard with other hop varieties around them, so you get a sense of really how they're gonna do in the commercial setting. Again, another cut here, say 3% of this. So we're ending with one to two varieties that are coming here at year six, seven, or eight um, in this process. And at this point, then the breeders are looking to brewers to say, okay, what, uh, what do you want? Um, here's my two hops from the, 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 the crosses I made seven years ago. And then it's getting buy-in from a, a, a potential customer, a brewer, to actually then start scaling them up to the point that they can be commercialized. So it's a long, long process. And that's the take home point here. And it's very difficult to, to gauge demand uh, for what's coming down the line in, in the future. When you look at who's doing what in the US, uh, their breeding targets are around alpha still. I mean, I think people are still interested in high alpha varieties, particularly with disease resistance, um, dual purpose. so alpha with flavor, and then also unique flavors, unique distinctive flavors. That's a big focus of the, of the US breeding industry. In Germany, it's somewhat the same um, case, although they're still interested in what they call typical fine Germanic hop aroma, but uh, they're also focused on flavor varieties in Australia. Really, when I talked to the breeders there, he said, okay, it's first and foremost yield, second, a harvest window that is somewhere different than what the current harvest window is, so you can expand the growing season and the picking season, but certainly looking for aromas that are distinctive, recognizable, and accessible by brewers. You know, the last thing I wanna talk about is what's happening as a result of this demand, and the farming, um, hop farming industry is, is in great shape. Well, five years ago, everybody was wringing their hands about how they, how they were losing money. Now they're doing great. They're expanding huge uh, all over. Um, and the US and Australia have seen significant expansion in terms of actual acreage. In Germany, to some degree, there's some ex expansion. What's happening in Germany is that Germany is becoming the leader of the high alpha variety. So there's really more just a change out of varieties there. But probably the bigger impact that's happening in, beyond expansion is the uh, modernization that's going on. So. 10 years ago, or five years ago, five years ago, if you walked around hop farms, they looked like they were built in the 40s and the 50s, because they were, and they have not been updated since then. And so here we are at, um, this is Jason Peralt's, uh, his father's farm, and uh, this, is, this was taken four weeks ago as well, two weeks before hop harvest is beginning, and they have yet to finish the installation of two brand new um, hop picking machines. So it was a once in a lifetime opportunity for me to one, see how impressive this is, but also to like touch and feel a machine that has yet to see any hops on it. And so this kind of investment is huge. We're talking millions of dollars going into picking machines. Two years prior, the same farm installed brand new um, kilning operations and 
the result here is that they're putting state-of-the-art sensor technology in terms of temperature, airflow, humidity, computer feedback control with load sensors in the cell to be able to control air speed, um, humidity, drying rate. Um, so this is all going to have a very positive impact uh, on the hops that the industry will see um, in, in the future. So when I look to the future uh, of hoppy beers, um, clearly, um, as we heard several times today, it's about product differentiation. And what brewers are wanting are hops that can allow them to distinguish themselves differently from their competitors. Brewers need it. Consumers are demanding that. The growth of craft and craft-like brands um, um, is having an impact on how, well, the availability of hops and how brewers are going to be using hops, because uh, it's, it's just not sustainable to be using, in a small brewery, two kilograms of hops per, per hectoliter of beer. The inf increased sophistication of the beer consumer is having an impact on how brewers are marketing um, their beers to the, to the consumer. It's not just commodity anymore, it's very much about differentiating and it's about using hops to position yourself, whether it's by flavor or even by, by branding. And I think finally, the, the changes that are occurring on the farming, breeding, uh, and uh, picking drying technologies are all positive outcomes of this increased demand. And that I think we're going to see an improvement in quality as we move forward. And with that, I'll finish and I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, great talk. Um, a question about, I think, one of your first slides, the second one, I think. Um, in 1932, Oregon was the largest um, hop producer in the United States. According to or, uh, U.S. Hop Growers of America. Fine. And in 1933, it was the end of prohibition. I know. Exactly. So why were they growing so much hops? <laughs> exactly. It was export. So when you look at, okay. at, uh, at records, I mean, even going back, um, I was working, walking to the Fuller's Brewery last year, and, and they had a, a historic um, brew logs open for um, uh, you know, a 100th anniversary beer for, from World War I. And clearly you can see on that that brewers were using Oregon hops even 100 years ago. So Oregon was a, a place, certainly was growing hops before the prohibition came, but then continued to grow hops and export those around the world. Uh, Professor, how do you see the future of um, using hop oils instead of um, the hop flowers. Yeah, exactly. So that's a, that is a big challenge. I mean, anybody that's, that has taken an oil distillate and just added it to beer knows that you get hop aroma, but it is not the same kind of hop aroma. There are other things, there are other aspects to hops, the non-volatile components to those, whether they be flavor precursors or whether it's biotransformation of the volatile components that result in a true hop character. Now, if you want to build a brand around a beer that has never seen hops, but just using hop oils, I think you can, you can do that. And I think we'll see brewers doing that. But in terms of trying to use hop oils as a replacement for, for green matter or pellet material extract, it's, it's a, that's a difficult proposition because it's not as, as simple as just adding oils. And is this mostly for the image of the beer also? Is that also important uh, um, for the craft brewers? I, or? I think brewers have different targets in terms of authenticity or natural yeah. or local uh, and in some cases that's not a, a driver for what they want. They want aroma, they want flavor. Um, we're seeing guys like, like make Pliny the Elder, they use hop extracts uh, as a bittering hop. Even though they're using lots of dry hopping on the back end, they use extracts on the front end and to them it's great. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, one question, as the major U.S. producers further uh, diversify their product portfolios to include flavored alcoholic beverages, chalada paste beers, et cetera, moving away from strictly producing standard lagers, do you see some sort of compensatory effect in, as far as overall demand where, you know, the, the total demand for hops may eventually plateau, but the distribution of who is using those hops continues to swing towards the craft side as the major producers further diversify? Um, uh, I, I think no. I think what's, what, what will happen is that as the, the major producers respond to this demand for hoppy beers, and even if they move just slightly towards hoppy beers, the sheer fact that they have such higher volume in the U.S., that's going to have a huge impact on availability of, of raw materials in the U.S. And, and they know it. They can't just go out and say, you know what, we're going to now take a quarter of the Cascade hop crop because it's just not possible that the hop industry won't, won't let them do that. So their growth may be somewhat constrained in these categories because of the sheer availability. But I think if anything, it's going to drive hop growing 
upwards. It's not, I don't think we're going to see a static amount in, in redistribution, at least not yet. At some point, certainly, there's going to be at some point where we release, release a, I mean, reach a sort of a plateau, but it's still going up, in my opinion. Thanks. Thanks.